Okay, I think we're ready to get going. So we'll give it just another few seconds to make sure all of our technologies are set. Michelle, do you want to check to see if the chat is enabled? Yes, I just noticed that. Yeah, I think people are using the Q&A, &A, yes. but we're going to get the chat enabled right now. Try Michelle, do you want to check to see if the chat is enabled? I yes, just, I just... tried. Okay. All right, Michelle, are we live yet? We are live on YouTube. Okay. I'm going to hit the live button here just in case. All right, we're going to get started. I'm going to share my screen, everybody. And tonight's going to be our big night for emotion regulation. I'm seeing that the chat is working. So that means like everything is working. <laughs> um, we got people from Staten Island. We've got people from Newark, Delaware. Nice. Um, got people from New York City. We got Santa Cruz, Melbourne, 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 as I should say properly, Australia. Uh, Phoenix, Bethesda, Southington, Berkeley, New Rochelle, San Jose, Costa Rica, Bienvenidos, New Zealand, Colorado. This is really cool. It's really great to see everybody from kind of all over the world. Um, from Paraguay, South America. Welcome, Monica. And um, I got Melbourne, Florida, and I think it's Melbourne, Florida, and Melbourne, Australia, if I'm right. <laughs> and more Colorado and Madison, Connecticut next to me. Actually, I'm in Los Angeles right now. Just got uh, done visiting one of our flagship schools in Culver City, uh, Los Angeles area. And I have to say, I was just blown away. Um, this is a school that's been using Ruler, our approach to social and emotional learning now for a decade. They're celebrating their 10th year. And, you know, it is remarkable what can happen when you have great school leadership and teachers who are committed. Um, and I was just, just blown away by the implementation. You're like, if you ever want to see a place where emotions are systemically integrated into the way leaders lead, teachers teach, students learn. This is the place. So they're going to be one of our spotlight schools this year. And what we're going to do is um, go there, capture video footage of the work and share it widely. And um, it's relevant, you know, in many ways to the work we're doing today, because, you know, one of the thoughts, you know, it's not even a thought, it's kind of really based in just pure neuroscience and development is that these students in these schools that are doing this work well, like they have different brains. I mean, just think about it. If they're talking about feelings and learning how to manage their feelings from preschool and um, just thinking about how they feel, how other people feel, so self-regulation, other regulation, you know, it's pretty remarkable. So tonight's focus is going to be on um, the strategy piece of regulation. And so I will just get my slides up and we will go from there.
Okay, I'm hopeful everybody can see the um, slides. And um, here we go. So as you know, we start every one of our Permission to Feel book club meetings with a check-in. So can I get everybody to just share? Where are you at tonight? How are you feeling? What's your feeling word for this evening? You got some excitement. Uplifted, relaxed, someone's a little down. Sorry to hear that. Chill, energized, creative, exhausted, and overwhelmed. Relaxed, good, but tired, productive. Some contentment and gratitude. A tad disheartened. Sorry to hear that. Some little anxiety in the house. A little bit hurried. All right. So remember, today is focus on strategies, you know, and in previous book clubs, you know, I've asked you, you know, what's your strategy to get through, you know, the club. But today I want to take that a step further and really kind of get specific about that. So given where you're at right now, you know, like it is start thinking about kind of your, your automatic kind of go-to unhelpful ways of dealing with feelings. So everybody, let's just go there for a minute. What are your automatic strategies for sort of like, you know, not really dealing with your feelings? Anyone? What do we see? So we've got a lot of shutting down, ignoring, suppressing, avoidance, distraction, numbing, eating, alcohol, withdrawal, silence, disengagement. Doesn't look very good. <laughs> Michelle, I'm gonna call on you for a moment. What's one of your what's one of your what is your go-to unhelpful strategy? Unhelpful? Yeah, unhelpful. Eating. That's a big one, right? Just yes, just, it's a um, really big one. Um, just like eating to kind of assuage your feelings. Mine happens to be negative self-talk. I go into a, a, a spiral of, of just like, what are you doing with yourself? Why are you doing this? The world's coming to an end. You can you've been running around the world for thirty years, but nobody really cares. Um, anyone else have that negative self-talk going on? People on YouTube also have video games and social media. Okay, interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting to think about this. So where do our, what do you think your automatic unhelpful ways of dealing with your feelings come from? What do you think, where are they coming from? Family? Childhood? Conditioning? learn from experience, probably some modeling, right, of your parents or whoever raised you. And so what are the benefits of those strategies, by the way? Like, why do we use those strategies? Like, why would anybody, you know, think about it when you're rational, safety and protection, they work, they do work. Until you go to bed bloated, right? <laughs> or you, you know, you're, you, until you can't fall asleep because you're ruminating. So lots of interesting reasons in the chat, right? Um, they, can, they kind of become our automatic habits. And typically they don't have the benefit of solving our problems. Now, let's get away from those unhelpful ones. And let's just imagine for a minute, you're here at a webinar, go figure. And either you're in a good place, you're in that yellow and green place that's helpful for learning, you're feeling energized or you're feeling calm and content, whatever works for you. Or maybe, you know, some of you said you're feeling anxious or worried or overwhelmed or hurried or stressed. And probably those emotions are not gonna best serve you for the purpose of learning in a webinar 
right? They're going to distract you. They're going to pull you away from the present moment. So like, what are some of the like specific strategies that you feel are useful, especially in the online world of Zoom to staying engaged and being present? Some people are doodling. Some people are meditating. Ask some questions, some grounding exercises. Remove distractions, Legos, notes, drawing, watching your emotions pass by. Some music in the background, maybe. Okay. Good. So that's going to be the focus of tonight. We're going to start unpacking all of kind of the strategies that we've learned, you know, from our research around emotion regulation. And I'm super excited about it. And here we go. So everybody, you know, the last few weeks, we've talked about a few things. We talked about our mindsets around feelings. We talked about, meaning, do we believe that anxiety is a helpful or unhelpful emotion, right? Most of us have, were brought up thinking, get rid of your anxiety. Anxiety, you know, makes you fight or flight or freeze. But truth is, a lot of anxiety is what we call positive stress. It helps us, it energizes us. A moderate level of anxiety is actually helpful to get things done. It keeps you on your toes. It keeps you vigilant. So it's not that positive emotions are good and negative emotions are bad. Um, it's really that we have different relationships with all of our emotions. Um, now, we also talked about having a particular growth mindset um, around regulating, that we have to kind of have that self-efficacy, that belief in our ability to regulate. That some of us have a mindset like, you know what, no matter what I do, there's nothing I, there's nothing that will change the way I feel. Or no matter how hard I try learning strategies, I'm never really going to be able to use them. We call that what? What kind of mindset is that in the language that everybody knows about right now? Yes, that's the fixed mindset. Just as fixed mindset is applied to learning in classrooms, Fixed mindset is applied to emotions. What do you think are some ways that parents or colleagues perpetuate a fixed mindset around dealing with feeling? Anybody have some thoughts about that? I'm gonna get tough tonight. Labeling the child and not the behavior. So what are ways that we perpetuate a fixed mindset. Parents don't allow their kids to grieve. You're so sensitive. It's a bad thing. You always stop feeling that way. If I have to tell you one more time, you always lose your temper. Yeah, these are really good examples of like ways that we perpetuate um, or we do the things for our kids. And has anyone ever seen that? Where, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. Right? It's faster in many ways for parents to just like, you know, let me, let me just fix all of the problems so that you're not upset and I've got to deal with it myself. Does that resonate with people? All right. So now what might be some questions to perpetuate a growth mindset. Remember, the growth mindset is all about helping people kind of build the emotion regulation muscle. What are the what are some questions that we might use to support the development of a growth mindset for ourselves and others? What do you need right now? What did you learn from that? How can I help? What do you think? How else might you? pausing and honoring the feelings. Nice. Let's get a little bit more. Let's, you know, let's say your child like has a meltdown and they're crying. 
what are things that you might say or do to support them in continuously trying? Nobody expects you to be perfect. It's okay not to be okay. Sit with them. I know this is hard. I see you're upset. Maybe something like, you know, the deep breaths that worked last week might not have worked this week, but let's try something else. Let's try another strategy together. Um, and when something works, maybe you perpetuate that by saying, you know, let's remember that strategy really worked well for you the last time. I want you to put that in your pocket so you can pull that one out the next time. So importantly, we want to work on building out a growth mindset around emotion regulation. If we don't ever build the belief that we can do it, there's not going to be a lot of motivation. Does this make sense to everybody? That we oftentimes jump right to the strategy, but we've got to really spend some time working on just cultivating that belief in, your, in the ability. Okay, wonderful. So now we're going to go into the strategies. Um, just to give you a heads up on this. So when the pandemic hit, as they say, back in 2020, um, I was asked to do a webinar on healthy regulation. And I just started thinking like, I don't know about you, how many of you have noticed that, um, and I went on a rampage about this last week, I think for a few minutes, I won't do it for so long today. But how many of you noticed that you go into Instagram, or you into Google, and there's all of these, there's like, it's like, everybody has to do like, cold water plunging, like that's the answer to all of your life's problems. And then no, no, you got to do tapping, tapping is the answer to your problems. No, 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 you got to just breathe a certain way. No, 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 it's you have to, you have to, you know, walk this many steps or do this exercise or anyone get what I'm talking about here. I was thinking how, um, if I were to count all of the strategies <laughs> that I learned by watching Instagram, I, would, I wouldn't have time to work. I wouldn't have time to do resources. It was sort of like, it's like, there's like, it's like this endless um, kind of like strategy wall. It's just like throwing things at us. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, my partner's grandmother lived to be 109. And, you know, she did okay. Uh, she was pretty kind, pretty compassionate. Um, and she didn't take cold baths or like make sure she had an extra little half a teaspoon of salt in her water, you know. <laughs> and so the, um, I want us to be careful about tonight's lessons. Um, I really believe that there are um, there are buckets of strategies. And I'd like you to imagine right now, um, we're not going to use the bucket, we're going to use a pie since we'd like to use food to regulate. So we're going to imagine that we have a pie. And the pie has seven slices. It's a weird pie, right? Because normally you cut it in eight pieces, but this is a very special pie for emotion regulation. And it has eight pieces okay and the first piece of pie is around permission to feel the mindset so you're having a strong feeling and are you someone who goes into my job is to get rid of this feeling or are you someone who recognizes you know what mark this feeling is impermanent the it's okay to be okay kind of thinking, the permission to feel bucket. So I'm going to ask you all to take a moment and think about this for yourselves. Are you someone who just is accepting, you know, of your emotional life? Or are you someone who is living like the emotion judge, right? Why are you feeling this way? You know, you know, there's no hope. So let's just go there from a, and I like what you're saying, people. It's, it depends on the emotion. 
But remember, permission to feel, the goal of permission to feel is to help us all accept and be comfortable with all emotions, right? Because we can get addicted to the positive ones, right? People get addicted to positive stuff. And, but they're ephemeral too, aren't they? Just like fear, right? We're never, it's rare, although it could happen, that we're in a perpetual state of fear. Emotions, for the most part, are ephemeral. And so, what are the things that we might say to ourselves to give ourselves permission to feel? What do you think? What are some of the things that we can say to ourselves? What are some principles of emotion that we can learn? We are not our emotions. This too shall pass. I am not alone. You know, I, I'm seeing a lot of things on, on, on the, on, online right now and, and social media around, you know, like, I am like I am anxious. People say, don't say I am anxious. You have to say I feel anxious or I am experiencing anxiety right now. And I think that's helpful. I do think that is helpful. That you want to you don't want to define yourself as anxious. You want to acknowledge the fact that you're feeling anxiety in that moment. So on a scale from one to 10, one is I am an emotion judge with myself and other people. 10, I, I think I am more of an emotion scientist. I give myself and others the permission to feel. Where would you put yourself today? You get some fours and sevens and eights and nines and 7.5. Nice. So let's go back to the principles. What are some of the core principles related to giving oneself and others permission to feel? My, the principle that I live by is the principle of impermanence. And I have a go-to phrase when I'm in, in a really dark place. Um, I'll just give you an example. So I'm, as you know, working on my next book. I was flying to LA the other day. I, I had five hours. I was in Washington, D.C. giving a speech and coming to LA for meetings. I had five hours on the plane. I'm like, Mark, this is your productive time. And I was just completely overwhelmed on the flight, couldn't focus, and was starting to beat myself up for it because I had dedicated the time to write. So in those moments, what do you do? I'll tell you what I did. I just accepted the fact that I was overwhelmed, that I just, my brain was racing like a lunatic. And um, I got off the plane, I checked into my hotel, and 10 seconds later, I just went to a hot yoga class and it transformed my life. I can't tell you, just like, I'm like, Mark, you're just gonna have to allow it to be. And boom, I just sweat out the all. I just like lost myself for an hour. And all of a sudden I was like, I'm a free man. I, I actually can focus now. And so sometimes we try to force ourselves, you know, in the moment. And sometimes we just have to say, you know what? It's one five hour moment of the year. You're going to be fine. Okay. Permission to feel. What are some other principles? We've got the principle of impermanence. We've got compassion. What are some guiding principles that can help us remember the concept of permission to feel? Anyone? This is a tough one. What can be two things at once? Acceptance, agency, 
allowance, common humanity. Okay, nice. That's bucket one. So the first strategy in emotion regulation from the perspective of our work is we don't regulating doesn't mean getting rid of the feeling. I'm going to say that again. When you regulate an emotion, it doesn't mean you're getting rid of it. It means that you're making a decision to do something with it in the service of a goal. So if I were feeling overwhelmed and I couldn't focus and I had to give a speech, I would probably do a different strategy. Okay. Bucket number two, emotional self-awareness. You got to name it to tame it. Remember that? You got to label it to regulate it. Who can share with me and who can remember? Why is, it so, why is having a precise emotion vocabulary so important for regulating? What's the key thing there? There's a plane falls on me. Helps you get your needs met for accuracy. I know it's the R of ruler. Yes, it is. Granular granularity, what are we talking about here? Why is granularity so important? Why does getting granular help? What's the mechanism? Clears that mental space. The devil's in the details. Understand it better. There are a couple of, of very specific reasons. The first is that when we pause to label our feelings, we shift the air of our brain that's being used in the moment. So when we're in a strong emotion, our amygdala is activated, um, adrenaline, cortisol being released. But think about where language is. Language is not in the amygdala. Language is in our hippocampus, our prefrontal cortex. And so when we pause and say, Mark, what's going on for you right now? What, why am I, you know, how are you feeling? What you're doing is you're literally bringing yourself out of the activation and arousal and over to the more cognitive way you know, of, of, of managing. Does that make sense to everybody? That just mere labeling is an actual regulation strategy because it shifts the areas of your brain that are being activated. The second is that we tend not to regulate emotions. I mean, they're just concepts, right? Remember, emotions are concepts. Stress is about this, anxiety is about that. What we're really regulating, like in stress, for example, we're regulating the stressor, right? So let's say, you know, I'm using Michelle as, a, as an example, not a real example. Let's say Michelle said something that I felt was offensive or I said something to her that was offensive, right? She's not necessarily managing the anger, you know, she's managing the feeling, you know, based on the injustice, you know, of the thing that I said or that she said to me. And so that's what you're doing because so you're, 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 what happens is you don't say to yourself, I'm dealing with my anger. You're like, how could she say that to me? How could he say that to me? Does this make sense to everybody? That we're, when we're regulating, we're, we're really getting at the cause of the feeling. That's why emotional self-awareness is not just about the label, it's trying to unpack the why behind the feeling. You know, what's going on for me right now? For example, if, you know, back in the, my early days when I was studying martial arts and I was, I, I failed my yellow belt test, which is like the worst experience of my life back then. You know, I yelled and I screamed. My parents 
thought I was angry. No, I was just really, really disappointed in myself. And so, but the question is, well, why am I dis I'm disappointed? Because I thought I had memorized and learned all the things I needed to learn to get the yellow belt test. But I failed the test because I didn't do them very well during the test. So when you think about that for a moment, what that tells you is that you're not really managing the disappointment. What you're really doing is you're thinking about a strategy to manage the reason behind the disappointment. So for example, in the case of my martial arts, one of the better strategies, one strategy might have been the permission to feel. That might be the starting place. But another important strategy might be my father or my peer, my karate teacher saying, you know, Mark, you got seven out of the 10 things right. You got the three wrong. You're feeling disappointed because you got the three wrong that you thought you were going to get right. How about we practice those three? Does this make sense? Like this is how we, we the real pathway to regulating is to understand the feeling and where it's coming from because the strategy is going to be aligned with that specific thing for the individual. Give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. Any questions about that? Any any questions about that? Any anything to get help you get more granular about that? Questions? The more we can unpack the why, the, what's underneath the feeling, the more supportive we're going to be able to be to help someone. Right? There's a big difference in getting bad news from your lover versus an acquaintance, right? So that the way you would support someone in managing their feeling varies as a function of all those things. No, it, it, you don't have to be calm necessarily. You just can't be too activated. But there's an assumption by people, and this makes sense because this is what we're taught, you know, that all unpleasant, strong, negative emotions come with hijacking. I don't know about you, but, you know, I've had, I can feel angry and be in a very calm place in my body. It's purely mental. And there are other times when, you know, I'm completely, I'm a fearful and my whole body's freaked out and I got more adrenaline in my body to run away from the bear on my property. So try not to necessarily mix up physiology with emotions because it's not a 100% correlated. There are relationships, but it's not always. Any other questions about emotional self-awareness? You want to say use your words, but you really want to get to the point where you understand the, the what's underneath it. That can happen, you know. Again, there's then you know when you get when you feel overwhelmed by your emotion and you freeze, you know, the question is. In that moment, it might be difficult. You might just need someone to support you. But like, for example, the example I gave, my go-to, you know, five to 10 years of when I'm, I'm anxious, I'm anxious. But really what was happening on the plane for me is I was just completely overwhelmed. I had 500 emails. I had a chapter I wanted to work on. I had things I owed to people that I needed to like send stuff to. And I just was like, I just got done doing a presentation in Washington, then a workshop. I was on a high because I thought it went really well. And I was just saturated. And I needed to give myself the permission to just be saturated and then do the hot yoga. And then I was fine. So Helen, your point is well taken that um, if you're very hijacked, you might have to deactivate before you can regulate. Um, yeah, the, um, when you're in that hot 
processing place. Um, especially, by the way, I want to make a point here. If you're experiencing a traumatic event or someone else's, you're not going to be like, how are you feeling? That's not sensitive, right? That's being, that's just inappropriate. When, um, when someone is um, in a very activated state, especially around a trauma, I think the primary goal there is to comfort and deactivate. Okay, so emotional self-awareness, recognizing what's happening in your brain, what quadrant are you in, why might you be feeling that way, what's the word? All right, number three, managing your body's budget. I like that term, uh, and I borrow this from a colleague, Lisa Feldman Barrett, who talks about it in a different way. I'm using budget in terms of that we, do, we have a budget for regulating our feelings, right? What's your sleep budget right now? How, how is, on a scale from one to 10, what's the quality of your sleep right now? One terrible, 10 being great. Let me think negative six. We got a lot of variability from negative six to twos to tens. That's pretty cool. Minus tens. Yeah. So all over the place. Think about this. It takes brain cells. It takes energy. It takes resources to regulate. Does that resonate with you? Regulation takes energy. The only way you get back energy is by sleeping. So oftentimes what happens with people is they say, I'm not, I can't use these strategies, not working. And then I say, well, how's your sleep? Terrible. I said, oh, there you go. It's hard to apply the skills when your brain is not rejuvenated. The same thing applies to nutrition. Here's something interesting to know. Your brain gets its energy from Protein, fat, or carbohydrates. Our brain gets energy from protein, fats, or carbohydrates. Okay, see how we're all over the place? Primarily carbohydrates, right? Because our brain basically lives off of glucose. And glucose comes from primarily carbohydrates. So when you're hangry or when you're irritable at four o'clock in the afternoon, it's not because all of a sudden you become emotionally bankrupt or unintelligent, right? It's because your brain doesn't have the gas that it needs, which is glucose, to support it in finding the right strategies to help you. Make sense? The next one is exercise. For me, exercise has become one of my go-to strategies. Um, movement, very helpful. Just uh, a five minute walk uh, releases chemicals in our brains to help us feel more alive. Yeah, you know, looking out at the sky, looking at water. There's research that shows just looking at water is helpful. Yeah, the only time you, ne you don't necessarily need carbs is when you're in, when your body's in ketosis. But for those of you who've ever tried that, it's really hard to remain in ketosis. You got to just like, literally get rid of all carbs. Here's an interesting study. Two groups of people, one group exercised. Well, let me tell you a story. To, to uh, a study, people were um, either on a exercise bicycle or sitting in a chair in a waiting room. And somebody was a confederate to the researcher and came in and 
was going to basically like be rude and obnoxious. And the question was, would the people who were on the bicycle versus sitting in the chair respond differently? What do you think? What do you think was the result? Who responded better with less anger? Yeah, that's it. Because you know why? You've got why, what's, what's being released when you are on the bicycle. What's being released? Endorphins, exactly. Endorphins, right, uh, are, are related to what? More positive emotions. So point is that we can increase our body's budget by exercising. We can increase our body's budget by sleeping better or getting better quality. And we can increase our body's budget by knowing what foods to eat and when. All right, and I'm just curious. Um, how many of you here today tend to use mindfulness exercises? Give me a yes or a no in general. A lot of you. Okay. Anyone have a favorite mindfulness exercise? Like, a, anybody have a go to breathing exercise that they use to support them? Four, seven, eight breathing. Yep. Yeah. Square, box breathing. Discipline Zen practice. Coherence. Belly breathing. Body scanning. Kriyas. Nice. So lots of really good practices here. What I thought we would do today is do three different breathing exercises to support us in thinking about how um, the one I taught you, which is in out deep, slow, calm, me, smile, release. I'm glad you remember that, Maritza. Maybe we should do that one tonight for a moment. So what I want to do for a minute is everybody get comfortable in their seats. <sighs> Take a nice long inhale and a nice long exhale. You might want to stretch out your neck a little bit. The first exercise we're going to do is just counting breaths. We're just going to breathe to count our breaths. Easy enough, but here's the trick. When you do the breathing exercises, when you count your breath, you breathe in, you say one, and you hold the one on your exhale, and then you breathe in and say two, and you hold the two on the exhale, and you're gonna to try to go to 10 and then repeat it. We're gonna spend two and a half minutes on this. Let's see how, but here's the trick. If during the process, you get lost or you start wandering about a noise in the background or the air conditioner or whatever it is, you got to start over. Okay. So if you get distracted, if you lose track of what number you're at, I want to ask you to start over. Otherwise, we're just going to breathe in and out. And in our mind, we're going to say one and then breathe in and breathe out. And we're going to say two and then go to 10. All right, here we go. On your own, everyone.
Okay, let's come back together for a moment. How many of you are comfortable admitting that it was hard to go from one to 10? That like in your brain wandered and It's incredible, isn't it, how the, um, you know, we're so used to waking up in the morning, getting on our phones and doing Instagram posts and swiping, 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 350 swipes in three minutes. But like being still and breathing is difficult. Being with your breath and just staying, keeping your mind. All right. Now we're going to try another exercise. I'm going to ask you to do a little visualization. I'm going to ask us all to close our eyes if you're comfortable doing so, or just put your gaze down. And in this instance, I'm going to ask you all to, I want you to visualize the moon's reflection in still water. Just imagine a beautiful moon reflecting in still water. Okay. Was that easier or was that harder? A little bit of both for people. Easier at first than harder. Mind wandered. It was hard to stay focused on one thing. Right, just that moon's reflection like, wait, water, please move. I, I don't know if I can handle just staring and thinking about this one re kind of thing. <laughs> Harder until the ripples in the water. A little bit easier. Maritza mentioned one of my favorites, which is a guided mindfulness exercise. So for this one, I'm going to repeat some words for you and I'm going to ask you to repeat them just silently in your mind. The first is going to be in and out. Then we're going to say deep and slow. And then we're going to say calm and ease. And then we're going to say smile and release. Let's try it. Ready? In. And out. And deep and slow. Calm on the inhale, ease on the exhale, deep on the inhale. Slow on the exhale. Calm on the inhale. Ease on the exhale. Put a smile on your face on the inhale. And exhale out fully. Let's try it one more time. In and out, deep, 
and deep. And slow. Calm on the inhale. And ease on the exhale. Breathe in with a smile on your face, gentle. And release. Okay. How did this one go for you? What did you feel? Easier, helpful, less helpful? This one was the best. Easier to focus on my words. Somebody almost fell asleep. It's so funny. I got so relaxed that I got, I actually uh, messed up on the first round. I was like, Mark, you messed up. Love the prompts, but the pace is too fast. So see, this is part of the process, right? Some people, um, you, you can do this at your own speed. Good point. In and out. Nice. So the, four, the fifth bucket is all about our cognitive strategies. The primary strategy there, well, let me, let me ask all of you something. Give me a yes if you pretty regularly engage in some form of negative self-talk or catastrophizing or ruminating. A lot of you, yes, yeah, not, uh, not everybody. Anybody here have a famous uh, phrase that they rely on? Does anyone have a phrase that they use all the time? That's kind of their self-sabotaging phrase. You're so stupid, it's my fault. You're not good enough, I messed up. FML, uh-oh. Whatever, major loser. What's wrong with you? Funny, I haven't heard that one in a long time. My mother uses that. Uh, what's wrong with you? I'm a kid, mom. Blanket. Yeah. Here's something to think about. How many of you believe that you were born with negative self-talk? There's no way, right? It's just not, it doesn't make any sense. First, say we're not even born with the ability to, we don't have language. So there's no way that we can have stored negative self talk in our brains before we developed conceptual knowledge and language. So most of our negative self talk was defined for us by other people. For me, my low self-esteem came from my childhood stuff was like, your nose is too big. You know, I, I'm Jewish and I grew up in a very non-Jewish neighborhood. And so people would call me Jew bagel, um, you know, really nasty things. I was quite chubby as a kid. So I got made fun of it because of my weight. Um, I was not the toughest crayon in the box. So I got yelled at and made fun of because of, you know, people thought it was, you know, too feminine. And so all those words that come up. And so does this sound familiar to you? You're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too tall, you're too short, your nose is too big, your nose is too small, you're too dark, you're too light. I mean, it's, it's endless, right? Endless, what people can say to make us feel bad about ourselves. And my question to all of you is, well, how many of us had 
an early education and continuing education on sifting through the names that people call us and the things that people tell us about ourselves. To say, I reject that comment that you're making about me. Who do you think you are, you know, talking to me that way? I don't know about you. I just like, well, we saw the data from your survey. You know, most of you reported having very, very little education about emotion regulation growing up in your homes or your school. And so for the most part, you know, we're not taught from early on how to sift through the negative self-talk. And then what happens? It metastasizes like cancer and it becomes who we are. And you can't just tell someone like, be positive. Don't you love that one? I love when someone says, just be positive. Take, think, take a, you know, think about the bright things. It's a lot harder, you know, when you have spent 40 or 50 years of your life, right? Believing the negative things that other people have said about you. You can't just turn that off, right? Those are, that's part of your, it's, I mean, there's so many neurons in your brain that have practiced that self-sabotaging stuff that it becomes hard to unlearn it. So point is, most of our negative self-talk was defined for us by other people. And then we just believed it because there was no intervention. And now we as adults have to try to figure out how to unlearn that and challenge that negativity. As we wrap up our time together, how many of you feel like you've got some good go-to healthy self-talk strategies? When you notice yourself going down that rabbit hole, who's got some good healthy strategies? Let's hear them. What, are, what, do, you, what do you say to yourself? <laughs> in the end it will be okay if it's not okay it's the end it's okay not to be okay you got this addressing yourself in the third person which is very helpful mark you're letting this have way more power over you than you would have liked need a refresher club Pump the brakes. You're on the right track. One of the things that I think is important is that we differentiate our positive self-talk from toxic positivity. It's not helpful for children or even for ourselves to just say things like, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. You know, get over it. It's ridiculous. Right? That's the toxic positivity stuff that really never works. As a matter of fact, it tends to perpetuate the negativity. So the self-compassion does work. I actually just um, was at a lecture. Uh, one of my presentations, this other person who was presenting was um, Kirsten Neff. Um, and, uh, Kristen Neff, and um, she does really interesting work on self-compassion. And um, yeah, I was saying self-compassion, self-compassion, love her work. But remember, the key with self-compassion is also not to have self-pity, right? People confuse, right? So what do we say to ourselves to have self-compassion? It's not that easy to just like come up with that. What do you say to yourself? What do you actually do to have self-compassion? Sometimes life sucks. I believe in you. You don't deserve to feel this way. Mark, 
You worked really hard. Mark, give yourself a break. Mark, shit happens. It's okay. Yeah, so my point here is that we need more time spent rehearsing the self-compassion and the positive self-talk and a lot less time rehearsing all the self-criticism and the negativity. Here's my ending request for all of you because we do have to end, it's now time. Is that don't try to practice all of these strategies at once. You know, if your kid is having a tantrum, you can't be like, ah, it's okay for another feelings. How are you feeling? You need to get more sleep. Here, have a snack. No, take a deep breath. No, be positive, be positive. No, give me a hug, let me give you a hug. Let me give you a hug. I mean, you'll go crazy. And I tried this and I tried that. And you might just go nuts. So have some self compassion as you're trying out these strategies. Have some self compassion as you try these strategies. My recommendation is that you spend a week, a week, just focusing in on the strategies. Like spend a week asking yourself, am I really aware of how I'm feeling? Spend a week and ask yourself, did I give myself the permission to feel this week? Notice what you're putting in your body. Notice your movement. Notice your sleep. Am I getting adequate sleep? Am I eating the right food at the right time of the day? And then another week, give yourself the opportunity to practice the breathing strategies. There's no one size fits all. Find the one that works best for you. And then the self-compassion and all the self-talk. Catch yourself as soon as you start saying or ruminating, Mark, take the high road. Mark, you know this is impermanent. Those cognitive strategies. And finally, what I'm going to end with is two things. One is you can't do this alone. The better, the more you can do this with someone as a partner, you know, practicing with people, giving each other feedback, the better. And lastly, you got to put it on your calendar. And I mean that. I literally am going to ask you to put this on your calendar, to literally spend time reflecting on and practicing these strategies. Okay? Literally spend time, like literally put it on your calendar. Um, everybody take a nice long inhale. And an exhale. So as we wrap up together, what I want to hear is which one of these seven areas do you feel like you need to work on the most? Which bucket, which technique, which strategy area do you want to tackle first? Permission to feel, body budget, self-compassion, labeling emotions, shifting thoughts, quiet in the noise. You see, you're all at different places also. So the good news is that you've got the rest of your life to practice all these strategies. The good news is that you're going to use some of these strategies with certain emotions and others with other emotions. For example, when I'm disappointed, I tend to be, you know, Mark, just like you got to work harder. Mark, what, what happened there? When I'm angry, I tend to want to talk to people about it. So remember that emotion regulation is a process. It starts with, right, what is the feeling I'm experiencing? Where am I experiencing it? Is it helpful? Is it unhelpful? What's my goal? And then what's my strategy to manage it? And then what we got to do is we got to become scientists about our strategy and ask ourselves, is it working or not? And if it's not working, is it because it's a strategy or is it because we actually didn't do it? All right, everybody, we're going to wrap now. I think we're going to do another book club, um, probably just 
after the new year because uh, a lot of people miss this one for a variety of reasons and um, in that club we will go much deeper and what I want to end by saying is a few things one is um, stay connected on social media please so on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook um, if you haven't reviewed my book I would love for you to review the book somewhere maybe on Amazon or wherever you purchased it. Um, I always like seeing people's responses to that. Um, I'm going to send out a guide for you to do this with other people, which has very, um, been very popular. People like to just like take this and run with it and kind of do what I'm doing with their colleagues and friends. And, uh, and finally, if there are topics that you really want to go deeper on in terms of the research, you know, around emotion management or, uh, emotional intelligence more broadly, just send an email to drmarkbracket.com. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you for joining me. Thank you, Michelle, for supporting. And I hope everyone has a wonderful, wonderful evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Be well, share the secret.